أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شحل صدري وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِهِ Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In our previous lecture, we mentioned multiple lessons that we can derive from the story of Noah alayhi salam. One of which was just as there were, there was one group of people who was saved from the flood of Noah when the rest of humanity drowned in that flood. Just as one specific group of people was saved from the flood as they embarked the ship of Noah, the ark of Noah alayhi salam. Today, there is also an ark of salvation that we must embark in order to be saved from the dreadful and humongous waves of misguidance that surround us. And that ark, that ark of salvation, is none other than Ahlul Bayt, salawatullahi alayhim. After mentioning multiple lessons that we derive from the story of Noah, we started with the story of Hud, alayhi salam. Surah Al-Shu'ara mentions the story of Hud right after Noah's story. And by the way, this is the fourth story mentioned in Surah Al-Shu'ara. It's quite nice to see that the Quran mentions it after the story of Noah. Because when we go back to the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, we understand that, that Hud was the uh, savior of the believers after Noah alayhim salam This is an important point that we need to keep in mind. As you may know, there were multiple saviors that came to humanity throughout history. One of them was Musa, another was Isa, a third was, was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhim ajma'in. So there were multiple saviors that came to humanity. Traditions say, when I say traditions, we're talking about the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, the words of Ahlul Bayt. Traditions say that uh, Noah addressed his Shias, meaning his followers, and he told them that after him, there will be tyrants who will gain dominion over the Shias, meaning over the believers during that time. And he told them that their savior will be Hud, salamullahi alayhi. He will be Hud. In fact, there's a detailed tradition by Imam al Baqir alayhi salatu salam, which we can find in uh, Kamal al Din, the book Kamal al Din for Shaykh al Saduq rahmatullah alayhi. It mentions how one prophet would mention the advent of another prophet. Or how one proof of God would speak about the following proof of God. If you remember, we mentioned part of this tradition. It's a lengthy tradition. It's pages long. But we mentioned part of it when we spoke about who? About Adam, Shaith, and Noah. When we spoke about Adam and Shaith, alayhim salam what happened before Adam died, what happened during his death and after his death, and how Adam foretold the advent of Noah alayhim salam Today, inshallah, we want to shed light on the part of this tradition that deals with Hud, salamullahi alayhi. The Imam says, Imam al-Baqir, salawatullahi alayhi, when the prophethood of Nuh came to an end, and when his days came to an end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a message to him, meaning this happened before Nuh left this world, Allah Ta'ala revealed a message to Nuh and he said, Your the days of your prophethood have come to an end, 
and the days of your life have also come to an end. So transfer the knowledge you have to a person amongst your progeny, specifically Sam. Transfer it to your son, Sam. The tradition mentions that Allah Azza wa Jal told him to transfer al-ilm, the knowledge he had, al-ism al-akbar, the greatest name of Allah Azza wa Jal. No one knew it. And he was told to transfer it to Sam, alayhi salam. He was also told to transfer al-iman, to transfer faith. Al-iman, if I want to give you a literal translation, means what? It means faith or religion. So he was told to transfer that to Sam. What does that mean? It doesn't mean Sam wasn't faithful before. He was faithful. But what I understand from this word is that Sam was becoming the preserver or the caretaker of the religion of God after Noah. Allah had decreed that Sam will be the caretaker of God's religion after Noah alayhi salam. So he was told to pass down his knowledge to Sam, salamullah alayhi. And Allah told Nuh alayhi salam. He told him that in every era, there will be someone who will possess that knowledge, who will possess al-ism al-akbar, the greatest name of God, al-iman, faith, who will possess the knowledge of Noah. And that someone will be from the progeny of the prophets who came between the times of Adam and Nuh, which means that the proofs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after Noah alayhi salam are all descendants of Adam and Noah, and of course the prophets who came in between the times of Adam and Noah, salamullahi alayhim. He also told Nuh alayhi salam that there will always be a scholar on earth through which the religion of God will be known. He tells him that there will always be a, a scholar on earth through which my religion will be known, meaning Allah's religion, and through which my obedience will be known. So that scholar is unlike other scholars. He's what? He's an infallible scholar, what we call the proof of Allah, hujjatullah. This scholar guides people to Allah's religion and also tells them how they're supposed to obey God. Then Allah tells him that through these scholars, meaning these proofs of God, he saves the people who come into this world after the death of a prophet and before the advent of another prophet. What does this imply? It implies that sometimes the earth is devoid of a prophet. There are times in which there are no prophets, like our eras, right? There is no prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Similarly, between Isa and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, there were uh, a lot of years in which there were no prophets on earth. So there could be eras in which no prophets exist on earth, but there is always a proof of Allah on earth. If there isn't a prophet, there's what? There's a successor of a prophet. There's someone who represents Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophets of God, salamullah alayhim. That someone is infallible and he guides people to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we were asked, for example, who um, was in charge of guiding people after Isa alayhi salam, our answer would be Shamon al Safa, Simon Peter, who wasn't a prophet, but he was a successor. If we were asked, who are, you know, the proofs of Allah right now? Who is the proof of Allah right now? The answer would be Sahib al-Asri wa zaman May Allah hasten his reappearance. For we Shias believe that after Rasulullah, there are 12 Imams. Each one of them is the proof of God subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us go back to the tradition of Imam al-Baqr. He says, he says, after Sam came Hud. What does he mean by this word? It seems that he means, alayhi salam, Hud was the greatest prophet, or say the biggest prophet, after Sam. 
He doesn't mean to say that there are absolutely no prophets in between their times. Why? Because Iman continues and says, the prophets who came uh, in between the eras, in between the times of Sam and Hud, السلام, some were in hiding and some weren't in hiding, which confirms a point we mentioned in the first lectures, if you remember, were not the first people to be tested through an occultation. We're not the first people to be tested through the occultation of God's proof. Here is Imam al-Bakr telling you that certain prophets who came after Sam and before Hud السلام, were what? Were in hiding. So they were on earth, but they were in a state of occultation. Then the Imam says, he says, Noah said a word to his people, to his people. What did he say? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send a prophet called Hud. This prophet will call his people to God, but they will disbelieve in him. And as a result, Allah ta'ala will destroy them through wind meaning through violent wind as we shall hear through a violent wind when he comes to you believe in him and follow him if you do so allah ta'ala will save you from that violent wind what is this this is the will of nuh this is nuh's will regarding who regarding hud alayhim assalam the imam says imam al-baqir Nuh told Sam, he told him to look into this will, to read this will. How many times? Once per year. He told him that every year, at the start of the year, he wants him to read that will. Not only to himself, rather, he wants him and the believers with Sam, alayhi salam, to remember this will. Why? So they may remember the advent of Hud and may be ready to welcome Hud and to believe in him once he comes. This is similar to how Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam uh, tried to prepare us for the advent of Sahib al-Zaman Allah ta'ala farajahu sharif by mentioning what will happen when Sahib al-Zaman arises, the signs of the reappearance, etc. So the Imam says, alayhi salam, when Hud finally came, when Hud finally came, the believers at that time looked at the knowledge they had. They looked into the knowledge they had. And they realized, subhanAllah, this is Hud. This is the Hud that Nuh alayhi salam spoke of. So they believed in him and followed him. As a result, when Allah Ta'ala destroyed the people of Hud, those believers were what? those believers were saved. Bear in mind, these believers must have believed in Hud before his advent because they already knew that Nuh spoke about a man called Hud. But the thing is, they were trying to see who is this Hud. Finally, when he came, they realized this is the person we've been waiting for and that will happen as well. This is exactly, inshallah, this is exactly what will happen when Sahib al-Zaman reappears alayhi salam, the believers will realize this is the promised Mahdi. This is the Mahdi we've all been waiting for alayhi afdal as-salat wassalam. We mentioned yesterday, if you remember, that Hud reminded his people of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a general piece of advice which helps people cleanse themselves from any sin. Whenever someone commits a sin, uh, the, the piece of advice regarding piety, reminding him of piety, is an excellent piece of advice because it will help with any sin. But even then, who would tackle certain sins that his people committed? And the first sin we mentioned yesterday was what? Was wasting. They would waste time, money, an effort as they would build huge monuments on 
uh, heights, hills, and or mountains for no reason. They would build those monuments for no reason. So they were wasting their time, effort, and their money. This brought us to what? To the topic of wasting. And we said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Muslims, He wants us to follow a middle path which lies between two extremes, stinginess and extravagance. He doesn't want you to be extravagant and He doesn't want you to be stingy. This is where we stopped and we presented a tradition by Imam al Sadiq sallallahu alayhi which explained through body language, the Imam explained through body language, what is extravagance, what is stinginess, and what is this middle path which lies between stinginess and extravagance. We've understood that as Muslims, we're not demanded to refrain from spending money. Rather, we're demanded to, sp to spend money in the right way, in the right manner. So there are times in which you must spend money and there are times in which you should refrain from spending money. Here, I want to share with you a tradition in Al-Kafi Al-Sharif by Imam Al-Sadiq alayhi salam, which sheds more light on this topic. As I told you, there are plenty of traditions that speak about the limits of uh, spending money, when are you extravagant, when you're not. So it's wise to read these traditions. For today, we want to share with you the following tradition where the narrator asks Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he tells him, فَمَلْ iqtar. He tells him, what is stinginess? So the Imam says, he answers by giving an example. And I believe you know that giving examples is one of the best ways through which you can make people understand a particular concept. If you want people to understand concepts, present what? Present examples. So the Imam said, alayhi salam, he said, He said, stinginess is to basically eat bread and salt when you're able, meaning you're financially able, to buy other types of food. Remember, the Imam is giving what? An example. He's saying if someone has money and he's able to buy meat, chickpeas, fava beans, he's able to buy, you know, fruits, vegetables, chicken, etc. And he only buys, you know, bread and salt. He says, this is what? This is stinginess. Then he's asked, alayhi salam, He's told, فَمَلْ قَصْدُ Then, what is this middle path which lies between extravagance and um, stinginess? The Imam السلام, also presents an example pertaining to food. He says, الْخُبْزُ وَاللَّحْمُ وَاللَّبَنُ وَالْخَلُّ وَالسَّمْنُ مَرَّ هَذَا he says, if you want to follow that middle path, then buy bread, meat, milk, and or yogurt, vinegar, margarine. You should sometimes eat this type of food and sometimes that type of food. What do we understand from this tradition? We understand from the Imam alayhi salam that it's not wrong to buy different types of food. If you want to refrain from being extravagant, you don't have to, you know, have a very simple diet where you're only eating, for example, uh, bread and salt. No, you can, you can buy various types of food because these types of food are needed for the body. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a generous Lord Allah wouldn't create a human being in a way in which the human needs certain types of food and then forbid that type of food on the human. This is stinginess. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't create us in a way in which we need, for example, milk. 
then tell us, you know what, you can't drink milk. Why would he do that? If he wants to forbid something upon us, it means, or in better terms, if he forbids something upon us, it means we don't need it. Allah is a generous Lord. I repeat, if he forbids something upon us, it means it's not needed. If it was needed, he would have made it lawful. And if someone were to say, but there are certain things that the human body needs that are unlawful, our reply to that is, you're wrong. The, the body doesn't need such things. And if we suppose that the body needs them, Allah has already allowed us to do what? Allowed us to consume or to acquire other things that are lawful and that present the same benefits to the human body. So we understand from Imam al-Sadiq's tradition السلام, that it's not wrong to spend money on various types of food and that it's not wrong to spend money on things that uh, give you comfort whilst you're on earth. Things, things that make your life a comfortable life. That's not wrong. And it's not part of extravagance. This is a second tradition, a second tradition concerning wasting. In a third tradition, by Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, the Imam says that the Prophet said sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, man iqtasada fi ma'ishatih, razaqahu Allah. He who follows a middle path between extravagance and stinginess, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do what will sustain him. So the, the Prophet here teaches us that when we're not extravagant, what does Allah do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases our sustenance. If you want your sustenance to be increased, show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you uh, know how to spend your money and you know how to control yourself when it comes to spending money. Then the Imam says, the Prophet says, وَمَنْ بَذَّرَ حَرَمَهُ اللَّهُ As for he who wastes, Allah Ta'ala will deprive him of sustenance. So when Allah Azza wa Jal sees us misbehaving when it comes to money, spending money uh, right and left without any limits, what does he do? He deprives us of more sustenance. Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. So the first problem that, that Hud mentions Regarding his community is what? Wasting. What's the second problem? Surah al-Shu'ara says, وَتَتَّخِذُونَ مَصَانِعَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَخْلُدُونَ He says, alayhi salam, he tells them, and you make strong fortresses that perhaps you may live. The books of Tafsir tell us, based on this verse, of course, that the people of Hud used to build mansions, huge, humongous places of residence, mansions and or castles. So Hud السلام, came forth and objected to this issue. He told them, as if he was saying, what is wrong with you? You're building these mansions and or castles in hope of what? In hope of staying alive, in hope of staying in this world. Here one might say, what's the problem with having a big house or having a, a big place of residence? So what? You know, having a big house, having a spacious house is good. It comforts the human being. So why is Hood objecting to what they're doing? First, we say, correct, you're right. There is nothing wrong in having a spacious house. We can have a spacious house. We can have a big house. The traditions of Ahlul Bayt, alayhum salatu was salam, are clear on this regard. The traditions of Ahlul Bayt consider that having a spacious house is a cause of happiness. I repeat, having a spacious house 
is a cause of happiness. Let me share a tradition with you on this regard. You can find the tradition in the book Mizan al-Hikmah. The Prophet is narrated to have said, Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Inna min saadatil mar'il muslim an yashbahahu waladuh. The Prophet says that there are four things that cause happiness, that instill happiness in the heart of a Muslim. What are these four things? The first one is to have a child who resembles him. Meaning having a son or a daughter that resembles you. Which is true. When you see, when you have children, you become happy. And if the children resemble you, you become even more happy. You like to see, you know, um, you, you like to see um, a smaller you walking on the face of the earth. The second cause of happiness is what? He says, وَالْمَرْأَ الْجُمَلَاء or الْجَمْلَاء ذَاتِ الدين. The second cause of happiness is a wife who is beautiful on the inside and the outside. Meaning, a wife, the Prophet says, a wife who is faithful and beautiful. So she's beautiful on the inside because she's faithful. She's a righteous human being. And she's beautiful on the outside due to her physical appearance. This also does what? Instills happiness in the heart of the Muslim. The third cause of happiness, he says, وَالْمَرْكَبْ الْهَنَيِّ it is to have a comfortable means of transportation. For example, a, comf a comfortable car, a comfortable van, uh, a comfortable pickup truck, etc. Having a comfortable means of transportation is also a cause of happiness. Last but not least, he says, well, maskanun wasir. He says, the fourth cause of happiness is a place of residence that is wasa, that's spacious. Which is, which makes sense, right? When you enter a spacious house, you feel comfortable. Whereas when you enter a house that's very tight, you feel or might feel an amount of discomfort. So there's nothing wrong with having, you know, a spacious house. But this is not what Hud alayhi salam is objecting to. So what is he objecting to? Well, look at the verse carefully. He says, Firstly, their houses were humongous. It's one thing to have a spacious and it's one thing to have, you know, a house that could fill a whole nation, that could, that could fit a whole nation. They're two different things. Even then, Hood's main concern is what? is the latter part of the verse as he says he tells them i know why you're doing this why you're building these huge fancy mansions and or castles it's because you have hope that you remain in this world you know what that means it means the people of hud alayhi salam forgot about death you know death is is an incident that one cannot avoid, correct? Every human being, whether he's faithful or not, knows that sooner or later he will die. This is one thing that human beings agree on. We might disagree, you know, when it comes to uh, beliefs about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the prophets, about the hereafter, etc., but there's one belief we all agree on, everyone, absolutely everyone, and that is, everyone will die. The people of Hud forgot about that. They had hope that they will remain alive in this world. So they forgot about death, which means they definitely forgot about the hereafter. Put the hereafter behind your back, you know. They forgot about it without doubt. When a person forgets about the hereafter and forgets about death, this person will be closer to disobeying Allah Ta'ala and more distant from obeying Him. As for if someone disbelieves in the hereafter, 
that person not only will be closer to sin and farther away from obedience, that person will be afflicted with a scary state, a state a state that might lead him to committing major indecencies and or crimes. You might ask why? Why would the human being commit major crimes, commit, for example, murder, commit major indecencies if he disbelieves in the hereafter? Simply because he realizes no one is going to punish him, or at least that's what he believes. He believes that no one will punish him. If there's no hereafter, that means there's no hell, no heaven. So there's no punishment for my sins. On top of that, no one will question me. This is what the human being will start to think. No one will question me. No one will reckon me. So why should I refrain from you know, killing this person and committing this sort of injustice and that sort of indecency. This is what happens when what? When a person disbelieves in the hereafter. Hence, believing in the hereafter and remembering it constantly is essential. This is why I realize Ahlul Bayt Salamullah alayhim used to remind people about the hereafter in their sermons, in their supplications, in their words. Take the example of Dua Abi Hamza Thumali, which we read during the month of Ramadan. Or Dua Ya Uddati, which also we read in the month of Ramadan. Or other supplications, like Dua al Jawshan Al-Kabir. You realize there are passages there, especially in Dua Abi Hamza, that mention the stages of the hereafter. Imam al-Sajjad is doing this purposely. Ahlul Bayt are doing this purposely, alayhim salam. We human beings need to remember the stages of the hereafter. We need to remember on a daily basis or a weekly basis the stage of Sakarat al-Maut, when the angel of death is pulling our souls out of our bodies. We need to remember purgatory, what will happen in that dark and lonely grave we need to remember the stages of the Day of Judgment. What will happen when I'm resurrected and when I need help, but everyone beside me is preoccupied with themselves, with himself or herself. These stages, remembering them, brings the person closer to obedience, farther away from disobedience. Why? Simply because it instills fear in our hearts. That's positive fear which pushes us to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to refrain from disobedience. So the people of Hud were in a state of spiritual paralysis. Spiritual paralysis. They forgot death. They wanted to remain in this world. And they were building these huge monuments, huge houses, mansions, or castles because they had hope they will remain on earth. Remembering death, as I told you, is essential. Hence, you find Imam Ali alayhi, constantly would remind the Muslims about that. Read his khutab, his sermons, especially the sermons of Najul Balagha. You'll find Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam mentioning death abundantly. Tonight, with the rest of the time we have, I want to share with you one of those sermons. It's a short sermon, but very eloquent. And how could it not be eloquent when it's coming out from the heart of eloquence? Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhima afdalu salat was salam. The tradition, the sermon can be found in Nahj al It's said, it's narrated, that Imam Ali was walking in a funeral. He was in a burial procession and he heard someone laughing. As he's in the funeral, as he's in the burial procession, what we call tashia, he heard someone laughing. The Imam was disturbed. Why would someone be laughing at a time like this? Firstly, it's disrespectful for 
the family members of the deceased. Secondly, it's not a time to laugh. It's a time to remember what will happen to us one day. Because the people that die in our life, the people that die, the messages that we receive, for example, on our phones or on Facebook or Instagram, etc., about people dying, all of these are messages from Malak al Maut alayhi salam telling us, listen, I'm coming. Sooner or later, I will come and I will take your soul and take you to the hereafter. The tradition says that when Malak al Maut alayhi salam pulls the soul of a human being out of its body, and the family members of that human begin crying. He tells them, don't cry, for I will come back to you. And I will come back until none of you are left. Meaning, I'm going to come back and take each one of your souls to the hereafter. Bear in mind, Malak al Maut is not an evil angel. He's not evil. He's a kind angel, alayhi salam. But his duty is to do what? His duty is to collect the souls of the humans and to take them to the here after. So he, these are messages from Hazrail Salamullahi Alaihi. That person was laughing in the burial procession instead of thinking, what will happen to me? You know, how will my state be when I am carried towards my grave? So the Imam said the following word. He said, Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, كَأَنَّ الْمَوْتَ فِيهَا عَلَىٰ غَيْرِنَا كُتِبْ He said, it's as if Allah decreed that people will die, but we won't die. The Imam here is describing the state of the human being. The human being, at times, fools himself into believing that, you know, his mom will die, his brother will die, his friends will die, but he won't die. The Imam, Salamullah is trying to wake us up, telling us, no, 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 wake up. Everyone, including yourself, will die one day. Then he says, He says, it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has directed his commands at fellow human beings, but he hasn't directed those commands at us. Here the Imam alayhi salam is pointing to another problem that sometimes we might uh, go through. If we see someone, you know, doing something uh, incorrect, something unlawful, we get bothered from him. But if we do the same deed, we'll be okay with it. So it's as if he has been commanded to obey Allah, but we haven't. Imam Ali here is also giving us a reality check, telling us, no, this is not the case. All of us are required of following Allah's commands, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he said, وَكَأَنَّ الَّذِي نَرَى مِنَ الْأَمْوَاتِ صَفْرٌ عَمَّا قَلِيلٌ إِلَيْنَا رَاجِعُونَ He said, when we see people dying, it's as if, it's as if they're going on a trip and soon they're going to come back to us. Meaning that we behave with these people, with the deceased, as if they went on a small trip, right? And inshallah, they'll be back soon, which isn't the case. These people are dead, which means they went to the hereafter. And they won't come back until when? Until the day of judgment, in which we'll all be resurrected. Or uh, the day of Raja, the day when certain people, not all, will be resurrected on earth during the days of Sahib al-Zaman. Ajallah ta'ala farajah sharif the bottom line is it's not a trip. You know when, for example, your family member says goodbye and he goes for ziyara, you have hope that he'll return, right? 
you tell yourself, inshallah, in a week or two or in a few months, he'll be back. So you don't consider his absence to be a big deal. The Imam is saying, alayhi salam, when he heard that person laughing in a burial procession, he's saying that certain people deal with this disease as if they went on a small trip and they'll be back soon. Meaning they're not taking their death seriously and actually thinking about preparing themselves for the same fate. Then he said, Nubawi'uhum ajdathahum wa na'kulu turathahum ka'anna mukhalladuna ba'dahum. He said, we simply come forth and bury the deceased in their graves. Then what do we do? Then we take their inheritance, the money they've left behind. And we use that money. We distribute that money amongst ourselves. We make use of it. And we behave in a way as if we will remain on earth after them. As if death will never touch us. Then the Imam said, قَدْ نَسِيْنَا كُلَّ وَاعِظٍ وَرُمِينَا بِكُلِّ جَائِحَ he says, we have forgotten every exhorter, meaning every reminder. We've forgotten the reminders that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown us. Allah has uh, instilled multiple reminders around us that tell us the day of death is coming. The afterlife is coming. Prepare yourself. Such as what? Such as the Quranic verses that speak about death. And the hereafter Such as the graves we see When we're driving for example from point A to point B Such as As I told you the people who pass away during our lives The messages we see on Facebook On Instagram etc Fulan intaqala ila rahmatillah Fulana intaqalat ila rahmatillah All of these are what? Reminders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The Imam says we've forgotten about all of these reminders And we haven't allowed those reminders To actually penetrate through our hearts And Affect us. On top of that, he says, وَرُمِينَا بِكُلِّ جَائِحَا And we've been afflicted with every jaiha. What's a jaiha? A jaiha is a grave calamity. A grave calamity. It's also a word used to refer to a phenomenon that destroys someone's wealth and vegetation. A phenomenon, such as a natural phenomenon, that basically wipes out wealth and vegetation. It's called jaiha. So here the imam is talking about what? He's talking about a spiritual jaiha, a spiritual calamity. He says we've been afflicted with a spiritual calamity. And that is the, the, the calamity of what? The calamity of uh, forgetfulness. We're forgetting the hereafter. And the calamity of spiritual sleep. We're in a state of spiritual sleep. Just as your body sleeps every day and wakes up, your soul also might sleep or might wake up. The believers like you, inshallah, remain awake until the day of their death, spiritually speaking. But most people, unfortunately, the Imam says in another tradition, most people are asleep. When do they wake up? They wake up once they die, when it's too late. Bear in mind, Imam Ali السلام, here is speaking in a way where you might assume he's talking about everyone. But that's not the case. Imam Ali, number one, isn't talking about himself, God forbid, nor about the believers like Malik al-Ashtar, Kumail bin Ziyad, Abu Dharr al-Ghifari and their likes. Those people... Those people don't forget the hereafter. Those people are aware of what's happening now and what will happen then. Rather, Imam Ali alayhi salam is talking about certain people amongst our communities, certain people on the face of the earth who don't take death seriously and who forget about death and the hereafter. But he's doing what? He's using a very nice style in exhorting or say reminding those people. And that is 
to speak in a way it's as if he's speaking about himself. This is a very nice style to use when you want to exhort someone or remind them of the truth. For example, someone backbites. You know that someone backbites others in your community and you want to admonish him. You have two ways of doing so. You can tell him, Fulan, backbiting is haram. Stop. This is what? The direct method. You know, you're shooting him with your words, of course, not with a, not with a pistol. You're shooting him with your words. This is haram. Don't do it. This is the direct method. Then again, there's an indirect method, which is to say in his presence, why do we backbite? See, you're saying we. So you're accusing yourself of backbiting before accusing him. Why do we human beings backbite each other? Why do we do this? Isn't it wrong? Here, it doesn't seem like you're attacking him. You want him to listen and you want to guide him. You might be a person who never backbites anyone. But you accuse yourself of backbiting so that he can be closer to accepting your admonishment. This is the style Amir al-Mu'mineen was using in this beautiful sermon. Tomorrow, inshallah, if we're still alive, we'll continue with the sermon of the Imam and with more verses from Surah Al-Shu'ara. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala al-Mustafa Muhammadin wa alihi al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa alihi Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum.